today's scriptures in uh, Colossians 3, 5 through 11 and 17. <clears throat> Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked sometimes when ye lived in them, but now ye also put off all these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not to one another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Amen. Amen. Again, if you'd like to find your place there, Colossians chapter 3, where we'll be at today. And uh, again, it's great to see you here today. Glad to see uh, Brother Dole and Miss Cheney with us today. They, that, they may have driven the furthest today, that maybe not, but they come to be with us today. It's good to see them looking good, and, and I appreciate them being with us today. I hope you get a chance Amen. to come by and say hello to them. And, uh, and that doesn't mean I'm not glad to see everybody else, too. You know, that means you're like, Bill didn't say nothing about me. Thank y'all for coming. All right, that's good. All right. Well, let's go to the Lord's Word of Prayer, and we'll dive into our, our passage today. <laughs> Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. And bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Father, we just come to you, and we thank you that you are the Lord our God maker of heaven and earth. And God, we thank you for all the things that you do for us in our lives, even the things we don't like and we don't understand. Because God, we know that you love us and that you are our Savior and you're our sustainer in life. The Lord, as we gather in this room as just really broken people, may we realize our need for you today. <coughs> Lord, I pray you give us exactly what we need, even if we don't know we need it yet. Pray you would forgive me of my sins and where I fail you. Lord, enter me of sin and self and me with your spirit. I thank you for all that you are. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for my brothers and sisters that are in this room today, ones that I may know very well and those that I may have just met this morning. Pray God meet us where we're at. Thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you are here last weekend, we kind of started uh, going through a little mini-series, and it means we're only going to go through it three weeks. Now, for some people, are like, feel a series, three weeks, that's a mini-series. For me, three weeks is a mini-series, okay? It's short. And we started this kind of this little mini-series, if you would, going through Colossians chapter number three, verses one through 17. And, and really what we've been talking about is really how God takes us, and he transforms us, and he really smooths off all the sharp, maybe the jagged, broken edges, and transforms our hearts over an extended period of time. And the illustration that I used last week is the imagery of like a river stone. Now, if you've ever been down to the river or if you've ever been to a pond, different things like that, especially <clears throat> probably more of a river or an ocean, is that when you go, you find some stones there that are underneath the water. And uh, maybe at times they're above the water, but most of the time the stones are underneath the, uh, underneath the water and we call them river stones. And when you look at them, it's kind of like this stone right here. It's nice and smooth, right? But if you think about it, it probably wasn't nice and smooth to begin with. It probably had some jagged edges, probably had some sharp, uh, coarse, rough edges, raw edges, if you would. But by being submerged, by being under the water, and that water moving, whether at times it was still or times that it was moving very harshly through the rough waters, it really smoothed it out and really smoothed it over. And really, if you think about it, it's really a beautiful illustration of what God does in us when he saves us. He, he grabs us, he takes us as we're broken, as we're fractured as we're jagged and then it begins over a period of time to smooth us out to transform us and really to shape us into something that is beautiful and you kind of like this rock here and I mentioned last week I don't know how many of you from my age probably a little bit older uh, whenever you went somewhere and there was water what would you do you go grab a, a rock or a stone to try to skip it right and this was a great skipping stone right here like this is great you could take it you could throw that thing really far no one picks up the jagged boulder and tries to skip it across the water why because the jagged edges won't 
allow it to skip, right? It won't go where it needs to go or where you desire it to go because those rough edges catch it. And we talked about last week in part of what we call sanctification. And by the way, sanctification just means that after you're saved, God wants to take you and he wants to take me and slowly over time being submerged by the Holy Spirit, which by the way, in Scripture is always a picture of water and all the fire and other things, but mainly water, is that as long as we're willing to submit to being submerged and the Holy Spirit to do his work over us over time, he'll smooth out those edges that we have in our lives. And just really seeing that, and we and we looked last week at really at the first four verses that we started looking at. Verse, and before we looked at those first four verses, we started with verse 17 because we said verse 17 is really a summary of what Paul is saying in these first 16 verses, right? And I want to look at that quickly together because I don't want to go through everything from last week in case you were here or not here. But let's look at verse 17 again because when we see verse 17, we really get a sense of God's purpose and God's vision for our lives. Here's what verse 17 says. And whatsoever ye do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to him, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. So verse 17 there, as you look at that verse, it really is a summary of what we call sanctification. This is God's vision. This is God's goal. This is God's purpose, God's desire for your life. And, and we looked at it last week that when you think about it, God is really actively up to two things in our lives. He's really, his vision is two things. One is God wants a greater integration for human beings. He really wants a greater integration. Because if you look at that phrase, what it says, it says in word and deed. That means this, an integration between your head and your heart. I think we all can say there's lots of things that we know that please God, we know about the Bible, we even have memorized, and they're all in word, but deed is our heart. Deed is our actions. Deed is what comes out of that. And if we're honest, sometimes there's kind of this chasm, if you would, that kind of divides what we know is right and what we actually do between word and deed. And hopefully what God is doing, part of the smoothing over process, He's shrinking the gap of what we can honestly call hypocrisy in our lives over time. And I think we all feel this, right? We actually I actually asked that question and asked for participation last week. Who feels like sometimes in their life there's this huge gap between what you know is right and what you actually do? And most all of us raised our hands. The rest of them were liars. And so we, everyone raised their hand, right, saying, yes, we understand that, right? That we understand those things and we sense this gap that we kind of call hypocrisy. But God's vision for our lives is for it to ever be shrinking under this integration between what our head knows and what our heart does and leads us to word and deed. But that's not all that we say God is up to. We also see in, the, in that text on top of integration, on top of heart and head, word and deed, the second part we looked at was this. He's also transforming us to be a people marked by gratitude and gladness. You see that part of that verse said what? That it says giving thanks unto God by him. Not just word and deed, but giving thanks to him. And can I tell you, there probably is no greater example for the Christian life in the year that we live than to be people that have lives that are marked by gratitude and gladness. Because if we're honest, a lot of people that you meet, you could not tell they're a Christian by their lack of gratitude and probably by their lack of gladness that they have in their lives. But may we be those people. We live in a day, if we're honest, that's very pessimistic, right? It's a day we live in It's hyper aware of what it does not have. We live in a day and age, if we're honest, it is easy to get offended by anything, right? So if you say something, offend somebody. If you don't say something, when they say something, they get offended. But what happens when the people of God just shine brightly by not being perturbed so easily, if we can say it like that, but just being grateful for what God has given, for God has entrusted to us, for his kindness to us in Jesus. I'm telling you, that will shine brightly in the cynicism day that we live in today. And we said this is what God is up to is after our integration. This is his vision. Integration, gratitude, and gladness. And, and then we kind of looked at how that path starts, right? And that process in verses 1 and 2, it talks about, we won't take time to read it, but it starts with what? Setting your affections on things above. That word affection there means your mind, setting your mindset on things that are above, not on the earth. It means that we're to have our mind on Jesus, right? We said as Christians, we're like all in on Jesus, right? We've kind of pushed all of our chips in on Jesus. We don't have another bet. We're, we're Jesus people, if you can say it like that. So much that whatever you want to talk about, this should be the goal in our lives. Whatever you want to talk about, 
we're going to need to talk about Jesus too, right? That's going to be, that's the mentality of having your mind set on Jesus. So you want to talk about marriage, then we're going to need to talk about Jesus. You want to talk about children, you absolutely are going to need to talk about Jesus, right? And then, you want to talk about work, we're going to need to talk about Jesus. You want to talk about money, success, Jesus, right? I mean, that's what we're going to talk about. You name it, then we're going to need to talk about who Jesus is, what glorifies him, if we're going to understand one another. Because to be as this verse says, and really the, the, the key verse in this text today is verse 11 at the very bottom where it says, Christ is all and in all. It's in those things that we understand that. And then if we looked at yeah, uh, last week, one of my favorite verses in this text is, is seen in verse number 3 that we looked at last week where it says this, your life is hidden with Christ and God. Your life is hidden with Christ and God. Now what that means in verse 3 is this. It's this idea that in our lives, all of our failures, all of our shortcomings, everything about us is actually hidden in Christ and God. Which kind of creates this new freedom for us, right? It kind of empowers us, enables us to live lives as Christians with greater freedom, with greater joy, the longer that we follow Him. That we're hidden in Christ. And since that's true, if you're here and you're a believer, your life is hidden with Christ, here's the next part of this process, okay? That was your intro, right? Here's the next part of this process of sanctification, being made more and more like Jesus. And this is what we're going to pick up with today, that Christ is all... And I'd like to read these verses again that Matt read just a moment ago. I want you to look at verse number five. And when we read these, I'm going to kind of maybe explain a few of them just a little bit. Just because some of the wording is a little difficult and some of it is stuff we don't use a lot today. So Colossians 3, 5. Mortify. That means put to death. Therefore, your members which are on the earth. And then he lists them. Okay, these are the things. Fornication. Uncleanness, which means impurity. Inordinate affection, which means passions. Evil concupiscence. I know y'all been wanting to say that word all day long since you've seen that. That probably practiced it 18 times. Concupiscence, whatever. That just means evil desires, right? And covetousness, which is idolatry. Go on, it says, for which things say the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, and the which ye also walk sometimes when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all of these anger, wrath, malice, Filthy communication out of your mouth. By the way, that means slander and obscene talk. Okay? Lie not one to another. Seeing that ye have put off the old man and the old self with his deeds, and have put on the new man and the new self, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. In verse 11, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, Scythian, bond or slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Now, if you have a background in church or some understanding about religion at all, that list of things that I gave you kind of at the beginning of that passage there about the things we shouldn't do, you know, those lists of things, I don't think anyone here was like, wait a second, we shouldn't be a part of anything that's immoral, like immorality? Why has no one told me this? Like, I, don't, I doubt anyone had that thought in their mind, right? I mean, we have an understanding of what's going on here. But something I want to kind of draw our attention to is the seriousness of what's going on in this text. Because the Bible just said, the very first verse, verse 5 said, mortify. That means you should put it to death. These things that he lists out here, he says you need to put these things to death. You should kill it. You should act very violently towards it. And then he lists all these behaviors, right? John Owen said this, and I thought it was a great quote by him in talking about this passage. John Owen said about sin and mortifying sin. He says, be killing sin... Or it will be killing you. Think about that for a moment. Be killing sin, or it being sin, will be killing you. And I feel like that's really a, a really important in our life. And when John Owen is pushing this point, that when it comes to immorality, when it comes to this outside of the bonds that God has given us, you should be serious about putting that to death. What he's saying is don't play with that. Don't train that thing. That is not your friend. It is not a pet. It will devour you. It will destroy you. Something is trying to kill you and that you shouldn't play around with it. But he doesn't just mention immorality here. He mentions impurity. And impurity is any moral corruption at all, right? If you are morally corrupt, you know, that's what we should be, right? You know, the idea, we shouldn't do shady at work. We shouldn't do, uh, like, behind-the-scenes stuff, right? Bush league kind of things. So if you're shady at work, if you're underhanded in your relationships, that's, that's moral corruption, right? And he moves on from there to talk about passions. And he's not saying there's not things you can't be passionate about. 
He's saying that you shouldn't be led by your stomach. Just your what your desires and hunger is for. Okay? He's saying you should be led by your stomach. Hopefully you're with me on that, understanding that. Uh, I, I like to make it the idea like this. If you've ever went to a restaurant or a or church meal or whatever, and you ever see like a little kid go through the line, mm -hmm. that's had to suffer through children's church or Brother Phil preaching or, wow. or whatever it is. And they see all that food. Because as good Baptists, we're going to eat. We're going to multiply the loaves and fish. We're going to worry to death that there's not enough food, but there's enough food, right? All right? We're going to work. And what do you do if a little kid goes through their, on a special level? Their eyes are always bigger than their what? Stomachs, stomachs right? But their stomachs tell them, man, it's there. Take it. Get as much as you want. And then they eat like 15 bites, and then you're mad as the parent, right? Because after they don't eat much, they get in the car, and what's the first thing they say? I'm hungry. I'm hungry. Wow. We've all had practice sanctification there. That's good, right? All right. And so you give in to these various passions, right? And then he talks about evil desires. And he's talking about those impulses or those compulsions. If I can say it like this, they're just out of step with God's good plan for your life. That, that's what it is. Those things are just out of step with God's good plan for your life. And, and, and everyone in this room, regardless of how long you've been around in church, we have these impulses, right? We have these compulsions. To give ourselves over to things that we know are just out of step with God's good design for our lives. And then he moves on and he talks about in the verse covetousness, right? He says covetousness there in verse 5. And here's why coveting is such a big deal, right? Like, if we're not careful, we see this list and we're like, I mean, I see this list, Bill, but surely this list of sins. Coveting? I mean, covetousness? I mean, that's like JV, right? That's like third string. I mean... That, that can't be on this list or equal to this. But here's what you need to understand. Covington. I keep going to say Covington. Coveteen. I'll say it right in a minute. I've been driving places, right? But Coveteen is an actual accusation against God. When you covet, and when I covet, we're actually making an accusation against God that God is not good, that God has not done what's best for you. That God is cruel, that he withholds from you what is good for your flourishing. When you make an accusation against God that is a lie and smears his character, coveting is a very serious sin. In fact, he said it's so bad he calls it idolatry. That's pretty big, okay? All right? You, you kind of, this idea of when you covet is such a sin because when we covet, we're basically saying to God, you don't know what you're doing. You don't know what's best for me. I know what's best for me. And I deserve this, right? And, and you have you given it to them, but you haven't given it to me. That's coveting, right? So what he says here, if you stop and think, is this. And he says to mortify these things, what he's done here is this. He's given us permission <coughs> towards violence, right? Paul is saying here, put these things to death. Drag these things that are a struggle in your life, that are a temptation in your life. Drag these things out back and kill them. And as uh, my grandma used to always say, my mammy used to always say, kill it, kill it dead. I never really understood that. Because I was like, grandma, how do I kill something but kill it dead? It means don't let that thing come back, right? Kind of like, for instance, I know some of you don't mind snakes. I am a big proponent of a relocation program when it comes to snakes. It may be relocating in the woods. It may be relocating with God. I, I, I really am not big on that. <laughs> But anytime I've had to kill a snake, and some of you are like, oh, you've killed one of God's innocent creatures. Be on speed dial, boss. I will call you next time, okay, if you look close enough. But it's kind of like this. To kill it, kill it dead means this. So you shoot it, you kill it, then you take a shovel, take the head off, and then you bury him in two different places. I mean, kill it dead. That bad boy is not coming back, right? So, before you get mad at me, some of y'all are scared of cockroaches, spiders, all, all of this stuff, okay, whatever you want to do, right? So the idea is to kill it dead means you don't play with this stuff. That's what Paul is saying. And, and he's saying he's not necessarily uh, talking about harming yourself or physically punishing yourself. It's not about penance here. He's saying this, but when you catch a whiff of this, this is your flesh speaking to you. This is your enemy trying to kill you. And he's saying don't play around with this stuff. Don't play around with it. Don't pretend it's no big deal. Don't be like, uh, forgive me for saying this, don't be like those dummies who take like baby tigers and try to train them as pets, right? Like, don't be that person. You you end up you end up being the being on that show when animals attack, right? 
Like, I just didn't know what happened. It was so cozy, so cute, you know. I said, let's stick my head in there like that. And then somebody gets hurt, and you're like, I've raised it since it was a pet. I didn't know it was going to do that. It's an apex predator, okay? Its job in life is to eat things, all right? I mean, that's what it does. So some of y'all, if you got a baby tiger at home, great for you. You know, something like that. You know, that, that's what it's saying here, okay? It says, don't mess with this thing. Don't play with this. And the Apostle Paul is saying this. He lists these things and he says, if you play around with this, somebody's going to get hurt. Someone's going to get destroyed. And I'm just saying very few of us, myself included sometimes, take this approach to sin. When we have these impulses and these compulsions and, and they're kind of towards immorality or toward moral corruption, very few of us have the thought, hey, this is trying to kill me. This wants to destroy me. We don't go, hey, I need some help. Something's trying to kill me. No, instead, for a lot of times, we're kind of like this. No, I'm good. I've, I've got it under control. And what Paul is saying, no, that's going to empower you. That's going to destroy you. Don't mess with that stuff. Put it to death. And then the next part, look in verse 6. So after you list those things, he says, For which things say the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. And I love this verse. And, and the reason I say this is, I think we don't think well about this because there's a lot of propaganda today in churches uh, because he says that because of these things, immorality, because of impurity, because of passion, because of evil desires and, and uh, covetousness, he says this, he says the wrath of God is coming. And I think if what I mean when I say this false idea in churches today a lot of times, I think one of the biggest, silliest lies our generation has represented is this kind of idea that God is only a God of love. That God is only a God of love. Therefore, he could never be angry with anyone. If God is a God of love, there's no room in him for any wrath. So, right? so that's what people think sometimes. Yet, I think common sense would tell us all, the greater the love, the greater the capability of wrath. Okay? Uh, I'll say it like this. Um, if you come over to my house this afternoon or any day, and you walk up and you take my shovel. Okay, it's 10 bucks, okay? You take my shovel. It's a nice shovel. I like it. I've had it for a while. All right? You take my shovel and you break my shovel in front of me, right? Or you pull your car out and on purpose. You run over and break my shovel, right? I mean, it's okay. I'm going to think you're a psychopath. Uh, but I'm just going to go buy another shovel, right? I mean, I'm going to be okay. But you try that junk out on one of my children. You try that out on my, my wife, who's my best friend. I mean, I'm a pretty stable brother, but I'm capable of things, right? You know why? Because the greater the love, the greater the capability of wrath, right? And we need to understand that. It's silly when you think God can never be wrathful towards the things that destroy the crown jewel of his creation, which is humanity. All right? We need to understand that. What does immorality do? What is this kind of compulsive, impulsive thing? What does moral corruption do is so discord is destructive and it's devastating to the thing that God cherishes and loves that's what it is right so he is rightly wrathful wrathful about the things that disintegrate something that he loves so much that's why God is wrathful right and then the next part here in this text is a really beautiful encouragement to Christians look in verse number seven and eight it says in the which ye also walk sometime when ye lived in them Verse 8, but now he also put off these things, okay? It's really great. He's saying this. He's saying, hey, hey, he says, you did these things. These things are what defines you, identified you as, and the wrath of God comes to those that are in disobedience to God and those things. He says, but hey, he says, but you are not those things anymore. He said, that's not you anymore, right? You used to do this thing. You used to be that way, okay? But since you have a new relationship with Christ, but since... Your relationship with sin has changed. He said, now since you're in Christ, right, you're right with God. He says, put these things away, right? Put these things away. And I can say it like this. This is the part of what he's saying here is, is kind of the hide the body part. You know what I mean? Some of you that love true crimes and all that stuff, you're like just getting really happy right now about hide the body, right? Uh, it's this mentality. Of, I remember when Rachel and I first got married, and she's in uh, children's church today, so it's good. Uh, before we go to bed, she would always watch a Lifetime or E or whatever that thing was. She would watch Snapped. 
<laughs> Some of you know what I mean. Snap like, we're about to go to bed. We're laying there in bed. I'm reading, praying. I was doing something. And she's watching about how this poor woman gets abused by her husband or something like that. And then she just gives him an arsenic cookie and puts him in the backyard somewhere and grows a flower garden over top of him. And you know what? The whole time she's thinking, he deserves every bit of that. And I'm just thinking... Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Right? Because it's late at night, man. I don't want this coming at me. You know, it's kind of a mentality. So when I say hide the body, you know, this I'm mentality, some of you true crime people are getting really excited. But this is what Paul is saying, right? It's not just knock it away. It says when these things come in your life, you have to put it to death. This is the hide the body mentality, right? Put them away. Don't let that thing come back. Don't do it. Bury it in the backyard. Whatever you want to say, right? It's the idea of don't let this thing that once would torment you and destroy you and rob you of your joy, rob you of your gratitude, rob you of this integration of shrinking the gap, the chasm between what your mind knows and what your heart knows. He says, don't just knock it out. Kill it. A great example of this, and again, don't you love some of the children's stories in the Bible? That were like, oh, these beautiful children's stories. Remember David and Goliath? David goes out, takes the stone, hurls it, hits Goliath, says it's sunk in his forehead. I mean, just think about that. It's pretty powerful. Goliath's a big dude. He falls down. Everyone celebrates but David. You know why? Still something left to do. He knocked him down, but big boy could still get up. So what does David do? The part that we don't paint before our children, before he's, all right, now, night, night, night. <laughs> David goes over there, takes Goliath's sword, stands above him, and chops off the head of Goliath. All right, good night, kids. I mean, that's not what you do, right? Right? But that is so important for us to understand that these things in our lives, and it doesn't have to be this list of sins. It could be any list of sins. In fact, he goes on more later. Sometimes I think we're so satisfied and sometimes downright prideful when we knock something down for a little bit, but don't actually, through the sword of the Spirit, which, by the way, is the Word of God, chop the head off that thing where it don't come back. That's called mortifying. It's called kill it, kill it dead. Yeah. Don't let that thing get back up. Amen. So you know why I stumble and get victory, and then later on I'm repenting before God, and I'm saying, what kind of worthless person am I? I should be further in the game than this spiritually. You know why? It's because I've knocked it down, but I didn't chop the head off the thing. And because I didn't chop the head off the thing, it gets back up. And it comes back at me, and guess what? It's going to keep coming back at me. It's going to keep coming back at you until you say, let's hide the body. Let's put this thing to death, right? Let's put this thing to death and not let it come back. And then he goes on to kind of list, kind of shows you kind of the unraveling of relationships. and Because it ends this with, in the end of verse number five, it ends with being uh, uh, covetousness. This kind of mentality of, you know, covetousness. You have uh, what I think I deserve and I'm not getting what I deserve. And, and give me just a second here. This is for free. This is not necessarily in my notes. But... Um, have you ever thought about sometimes with God, I'm, I, I'm just not getting what I deserve? Can I tell you something? You are absolutely correct. <clears throat> You're just probably correct differently than what you think you are. You're not getting, and I'm not getting what I deserve. And I'll be honest, we should worship our faces off because of that. Yes. Because we're not truly getting what we deserve. Now, if you're here thinking, well, I deserve a lot, then you don't understand what Colossians is teaching here. Amen. I don't want what I deserve because when I put myself up against a holy God, not against this Joe Blow down the road that I feel like I'm better than, man, it would make me worship God just continually to really understand that. But he gets into, he now, now we're coveting, and now we're looking at, I, I don't have that, I don't deserve that. And then you see the natural progression, right, that comes after that. Look down in verse number 8. Number 8, he says, Now put off these things, put them away, Anger, wrath, malice, right? Filthy uh, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth, right? And then he says, do not lie to one another. Now, what you just saw in that is really the disintegration of relationships, really, and the kind of relationships that form us and sustain us. So when I covet, right, 
that creates what in my heart? <laughs> Anger, right? So like I'm angry that you have something that I don't have or that I've not experienced, which you've been able to experience. And what happens? So I covet, I get angry, and where does anger lead to? Wrath. Now can I tell you something? Wrath is not always explosion, right? It's steadily building opposition against. That's what wrath is. It's steadily building opposition against. So here's how you've experienced this, okay? You've coveted, you've begun to be angry, then you begin to steadily build opposition against. And it, I put it to you this way. Have you ever been in an argument or disagreement with someone, and then over the next couple of days you kind of thought about that and stew on that, and you begin to remember, man, I wish I would have said that in the argument. I tell you what, if I go back in time, I tell her, you, you kind of think about those things. I'm the only one who does that. Okay, good. All okay. right, you know, we think these things, right? You start to replay things in your head, and it starts to build, and you have anger that leads to wrath, which leads to malice, right? Now, in your wrath, that steadily building opposition is rooted in anger, stemming from the list above. So now we're to malice, right? We want to harm them. Now, we're not psychopaths, right? We live in the modern day. We're not going to roll up and punch them in the face. I don't mean malice that way. We're way too civilized for that. But this is what this means. We begin to slander them. We slander them, right? We'll make up stories about them. We'll, we will point out their weaknesses, right? We'll take any credit they receive from others where someone might say, you know, hey, that guy's a really great guy. And we sit over and go, well, I mean, yeah, he, he's a great guy for a guy that's been divorced seven times. See, so that's slander, right? See, that's slander when you do that. You know, it's, it's that kind of stuff where we just want to discredit and slander people, right? That's the thing that it's talking about. That's, that's malice, right? And then from malice, it leads to obscene talk. Now, when we hear obscene talk, we think about cussing at people, right? And, and that's not what obscene talk is talking about in this text here. This is cursing, right? It's not language, uh, but cursing someone, like placing a curse on them, not like witchcraft. It, it, let me say it like this. It's the idea of hurting people with your words. So, like, if you come up here and you punch me good punch in the stomach. I'm not going to appreciate that, right? But there's some, I can get over that. But there are some things that you can say to me that I'll be honest will haunt me for the rest of my life. There's things that you can say to other people that have been better if you did hit them in the face. Because I can get over that. But there's things that we can say to people that will haunt people the rest of their lives. And by the way, you've probably been victim of that. So when he talks about obscene talk here, what he's saying is basically... You curse someone with your words. Then that leads to lying, right? The part right here in verse 9. That leads to lying, which he's basically saying that you curse someone with your words, but then when you get confronted about all this stuff, you have to lie and say, no, that's, that's not what happened. What had happened was, and we, we say that, right? You begin to lie to get out from underneath the weight of your own conviction. Again, warm and fuzzy today's sermon, right? We're all there, right? But then he moves on from there at the end of verse 9. To say there's some things we need to put off, right? And to put off, and then there's things in verse 9 that we need to put on, right? Look at verse 9. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, verse 10, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Okay? So he says all these things you need to put off, you need to put off, put off. And then in verse number 10, he starts saying these are things you need to uh, put on, right? These are things that you need to have. These are things that you need to put on, right? Put off the old man. Put off those things that are behind you, those works, those deeds. And again, he's talking about reworking this relationship that we have with Christ, right? Since we've been raised with Christ, since you've been hidden with Christ in God, he said these things you used to be, now you've been made new. So you need to take off some things, right, before you can put on some things, right? And then, by the way, may I say this? A lot of times in our life, we wonder why we, all these things that we'll look at next week, the things that we need to put on, like love and kindness and patience, we wonder why they don't stick. Because we're trying to put them on top of stuff we're not willing to take off. That's right. See, I'm not willing to put off the old man, the old great clothes, as the New Testament talks about a lot. And so I want to wonder why the patience doesn't stick. It's because I still got malice. I won't touch it. I'm wondering why grace doesn't work. Because in my heart, I'm still slandering, right? And so we can't do that. So in the New Testament, does this imagery of clothing and armor and taking off and putting on. And maybe this example, well, 
and I'll leave it very anonymous, okay? Because I don't know if anybody listens to stuff or not. Yeah, I don't know. So when I was in college, I had multiple roommates over the years that I was there. I had one particular roommate that worked for a fast food restaurant, which by the way, in college, you make money any way you can make money. You, you normally did that. We had those that worked for the, uh, you know, the people that called people, you know, those kind of, I was like, I'm not gonna be a telemarketer, man, I just can't do that. And so people work for fast food. This dude worked for uh, basically a pizza place that also delivered tacos, and he was a guy, right? So he delivered pizza and delivered tacos, right? And that stuff, and he would come in the room at night, and let me tell you, I don't care how many bath and body work candles you might have, <laughs> you weren't killing that smell, right? And so he would sweat, and all that stuff from working and getting out of the car and he smelled like tacos and pizza and sweat. That's beautiful, I know. All those different things. And he would take those clothes off and they're sweaty and nasty and he would throw them right on the floor. And then the air out all night, which is <laughs> beautiful, right? With all the windows closed and all the doors closed. And again, I'm just like, this is horrible, right? And he would do that, right? And then he'd get up the next day and he'd put those clothes back on. Oh. Round two of Taco Pizza World. <laughs> Sweat. <laughs> Not enough old spice in the world, boss. I mean, it's just bad stuff, right? He would do all that, and he'd do that for several days. He only washed clothes once a week at the end. I mean, sometimes, you know, when you think about it, it's in the middle of this picture here, and, and what Paul is saying is this. Why are you still wearing those grotesque clothes? Why are you? And the imagery here would be like my college roommate waking up the next morning, which he probably did, taking that sweaty shirt, putting it back on, and heading to class or heading to work. And you're like, that's disgusting, right? But the Apostle Paul is trying to create in the minds of the hearers is this, the same thing. He's saying, stop wearing that. That stuff that we listed, that's not you anymore. You've been saved from that. You've been forgiven from that. You've been delivered from that. That's not anymore. Take off those practices, right? And like I said earlier, I don't think none of this is surprising. Any of this stuff that we, we've talked about, I don't think nobody here is saying, man, I didn't know that was something that's not right. But I think the real question that we get to today is this. Then why are we so inconsistent in the application of these things in our lives? I mean, I know it. I mean, I know it. I mean, I almost did burn the dude's clothes one time. I mean, it was bad. But anyhow, you know, why is it that we really seem to lack the power to surrender in such a way that our lives line up with God's good graces. Why, 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 do we, why do we struggle with that? Well, I think the whole key to this text is at the end of verse number 11. But Christ is all and in all. Okay? So, the idea here, this aspect of putting to death, putting off, putting away, and then next week what we'll see, which is put on and be informed and be shaped by, all hinges around this one singular idea. And I think the more we can grasp this concept, the more victory we walk in, and the less that we don't grab this con concept, can I just say, the more we're going to be stuck by not being holy and not having holiness as a part of our lives. And here's what this concept is. I think the concept of this is your identity. It's your identity. It's who we are at the core of our essence. Why do you and I struggle with why do we not kill things dead? Why is it that we get victory and go back and victory and go back? And as we look at next week, we put these things on only realize later we need to put on more and more and more. I think it is, it's the idea of identity. Right? I mean, you even see that in verse number one. He says, if you then be risen with Christ, right? Notice that he doesn't say if you believe Christ was raised. He's, he puts you with Christ. He said, if you've been raised with him, even in verse four, when it says, when Christ who is your life, right? It's not Christ who you worship on the weekend. It's when Christ who is your life, right? And then you see more fully of this here in this talking about identity. Here it is Christ, life hidden with Christ. is in verse 11 where he says this, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and all. And what Paul is saying here so effectively, he's saying whatever your go-to sin is, okay, whatever your go-to is, and whenever you say, here is my identity, I am known as, and maybe that's you today, maybe you say, in my life, I'm known as one of those bad things you talked about today. Here's what he's saying. All those things are not obsolete in Christ. And that's the great thing about it, right? You might have secondary identity markers, 
But your primary primary identity marker that you are a Christ, that you are a son, or that you are a daughter of God, and that you have been raised with Christ, right? That's what you are. That's what you are. And this is what identity is. Put it right there, you can see it. You want the definition of identity? Identity is what you really think you are most fundamentally. And whether you feel good about that or not, that's your identity. It's what you really think you are most fundamentally at your core. And whether you feel good about that or not. Now that could be a good question, right? Who are you at your core? Who are the, the principal thing about you and how do you feel about that? But what Paul is saying here in this verse, he says you've been raised with Christ, right? You've been saved. God has shown grace in your life. So he's saying this. Oh, you want to talk about ethnic groups? Well, he just says in verse 11, where there's neither Jew nor Gentile, right? Jew nor Greek. Oh, you want to go by education? He says, where there's neither barbarian or Scythian. Scythians were the really intelligent people, right? You want to go by social status, where there's no longer slave nor free. He's saying this. Your identity is not made up where you decide it's made up. It's been given to you. And you need to accept that. Your identity is what's been given to you. And I think this is a concept that we really have to grasp really in the fullness. And it won't be easy for us to do that because we're living in a day where what I'm talking about right here is really viewed as villain. Villain-like, if you would. It's viewed as an enemy. Because really there's two ways you can view identity, right? There is achieved identity. It's an identity I achieve for myself. And then there's this received identity, which was what the identity someone outside of me has given me. And as we said, there's identity right there. It's who you really think you are, the most fundamental part of your life, and whether you feel good about that at all. At the core, you think about who you are, okay? And how you answer that question, who are you? We say you're a father, you're a mother, you're a son, you're a daughter, uh, you're a husband, you're a wife first. Normally, if we're honest, who you are in the group and who you are in the family that you're in most of the time, if you fulfill that role and you feel good about that or maybe you feel bad about that, a lot of times that's what we say our identity is, right? Maybe you say here, you know, our culture bestows honor on you for that. You're an honorable person. You should feel good about yourself, right? You should have high self-esteem because you're a good son, you're a good father, you're a good husband because you fulfilled your role. And identity for so many years has been found in self-sacrifice. For so many years, and I say for so many years because of this. I think after World War II, and I really believe this is the first hint of this that you see, culture kind of shifted from this mentality of no longer will you find identity in community, no longer will you find identity in self-sacrifice, but now the day and age we live in says you will find your identity by self-assertion. In fact, that's no long, there's no longer the heroic narrative of our culture, right? 80 years ago, Sacrifice, lay your life down for people that you don't even know, right? That, that was the thing. The last 60 years, it's all be true to you. Find your true self inside of yourself. Don't go outside of you. Go inside of you. You base it on your feelings. You base it on your dreams. You base it on your desires. If anybody tries to stop you from achieving your greatest desires, then our society today says we need to reject them as villains, as tyrants, and as oppressors, right? You go fight it inside of yourself. That's the air that we're breathing. And this is why I knew this would not be warm and fuzzy. This is what's being slapped in the face of us, our kids, and grandkids every day. You want to know who you really are? Don't look to God. Don't look to anything else. You look inside of you. You have to be true to you, right? And that's the air we're breathing. And some of you are like, well, Phil, I think you might be overstating that a little bit. Well, maybe I can quote some more modern-day theologians, right? I think they're more well-known. First is a Norwegian woman. She's the queen of Arendelle. Her name is Elsa. Okay, here's what she had to say about the subject. Ready? Let it go. Let it go. Turn away and slam the door. I don't care what they're going to say. Let the storm rage on. The cold never bothered me anyway. It's funny how some distance makes everything seem small. And the fears that once controlled me can't get to me at all. It's time to see what I can do to test the limits and break through. No right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free. Now, by the way, I'm not dog and frozen, right? I've seen it 8,000 times. I have $2, okay? And by the way, just 
by me quoting that, I'm going to go right home going, let it go. And so are most of you in this room too, right? I'm not dogging it. Okay? Cute movie. But this is the air we're breathing. Right? Nobody gets to define me. I get to define me. There's no right. There's no wrong. There's no rules. There's this inward journey of me trying to find my true self. And then I have to live out that true self. And if there's any opposition to that, then they're tyrants and oppressors. I have to find the real me. And my only hope at ever being happy is to find the true me. Well, if you're like, well, Phil, those Norwegian chicks, you know, they're liberal. Okay, maybe I got someone else for you. Let's see what Mother Superior has to say, okay? Here's what she would say. Climb every mountain, ford every stream, follow every rainbow till you find your dream. All right, let's stop for a second. Doesn't that sound exhausting? <laughs> what I just said, climb every mountain, ford every stream, follow every rainbow till you find your dream. Well, here's my question. What happens when you climb that first mountain and you realize your dream ain't up there? And you're 30. You're 40. Then, man, you still haven't found your dream. You better come down off that mountain and start fording streams, right? Right? And then you still haven't found your dream, so you better start chasing rainbows. And this is exhausting. <laughs> but this is the air that we're breathing, Right? It's, it's kind of like this, and, and stay with me, okay, especially if you get a little tense on me, okay? Have you ever looked at the backpacks at Walmart at the beginning of school? All these beautiful backpacks, and they all have this, uh, uh, these different sentiments, right? Make your own magic, or be true to you. What does that even mean? I mean, what, what does that even mean? Now, here's why I say that, and have a little fun there with it, I got you. There are some reasons in particular, I believe, us as believers... That this idea of finding your identity comes from just inside of you is toxic and destructive. Now, before we dive into it, I'm going to say this for, for, for some that may be thinking this. I'm not saying the old way was better. In fact, I don't believe in glory days. I think there's one coming. It hasn't happened yet, and it wasn't in the past, right? I don't think there's... We love the glory days. No, you didn't. You walked up the hill both ways and snowy. There are no glory days in the past, right? There's a glory day, and it's coming. So I'm not trying to paint a picture of yesteryear like it was glorious. In fact, the years past have plenty of tyrants, plenty of oppressions. But here's what I want to give you quickly. Here are some reasons why I think this mentality of finding your own identity inside, achieving your own identity is toxic. And here's what they are. Number one is this. To look inside yourself and you realize, number one, it's unclear. Okay, what I mean by that is that the deepest part of who you are there are conflicting loves, right? You have multiple dreams, and you're not going to be able to achieve all of them, right? It's incoherent. It's not clear. You won't know. Think of how unstable this leaves our souls, right? If you're like, oh, I have to find my meaning, my core, my essence inside of me, and we're digging around in those feelings, we're like, man, I need to be this in life, right? I want to be this in life, but man, I really love to do these things too, right? But I can't do both. Which one do I do? See, that's unclear. And God is never the author of confusion. God's not the author of complete confusion. It's unclear. But secondly, another reason it's toxic is this. It's unstable. Now, here's an example. Maybe you can identify this. Maybe you can. When I turned 24 years old, I could look back and see that 14-year-old Phil was an idiot. When I was 14, right? If you're 14 in here, I'm sorry. I'm not calling you that. I'm calling me, right? I was like 24 years old, and I was like, goodness, I can't believe that I'm still alive after what I was doing through those teenage years, right? I mean, at 24, I thought I was wise beyond my years. I thought I had some life experience. I kind of thought I had a lot to offer the world, right? And at 34, I really couldn't believe that 24-year-old Phil was allowed to do anything, much less drive a car. <laughs> Just being honest, right? And then at 44, where I'm at now, right? 44, where I'm at now. I look back at 34-year-old Phil and say, oh, the mercy of God is unreal. They gave that kid a microphone and let him start preaching in church. I mean, really, that's, that's just what I think, right? I mean, at 44, I'm 44 now. I mean, in my mind, in my feelings, I kind of feel like I'm seasoned a little bit. I kind of feel like there's a better nuance than I've ever had. I kind of feel like I have a good head on my shoulders. I think I understand some things well. My marriage seems to be going well. My kids seem to be doing well. I've learned some things I've needed to learn, a lot of time the hard way at your expense, right? Which, by the way, that's why, Lord willing, I'm going to give you my 50s and 60s because you've had to endure me for my 30s and 40s, okay? <laughs> that's the goal, right? Now, here's what I'm fully convinced of. 
at 54, if God allows me to live that long, I'm going to think that where I'm at right now is silly, uninformed, and harmful. So which one of those do I trust? My guess is that when I'm 64, I'm going to have some issues with 54-year-old Phil. And at 74, I'm going to 64-year-old Phil. And at 84, uh, 74 year old Phil and I'll just stop there because I don't know how long I'm going you know I, I don't get it right but at what point what I'm saying is at what point do I trust these feelings that we're honest are so fickle and can change so quickly about self-identifying right so what he's saying is it's unclear if you look inside of yourself it's unclear but also it's unstable <coughs> right it's unstable and then the third part is this if you look inside of yourself only find out who your identity is, number three, it's crushing. It's really crushing and excluding, if we're honest. And here's what I mean by crushing. When no God, no Bible, no parents, no community get to help form and shape our identity, the weight of all of that lands on us. When I won't let you, as a community of faith, or I won't let the Bible, or let God shape me and who I believe I am, then the weight of who I am all falls on me, and that's that's heavy. I mean, that's heavy, right? When that weight of self-identification lands on us, here's the deal. We will, by nature, take good things and make them ultimate things, right? Let me, let me give you some example of that. We'll take things and make them ultimate things, and we constantly get crushed. For, for example, love relationships. And I've used this example before. If I need my wife to justify me, if I need my wife to help me make sense of who I am, if I need my wife to Jerry Maguire complete me, okay, then I am messing up our relationship day one. I really am. I'm messing up my relationship day one. I am asking her to be for me what she cannot be. I'm saying, I need you to justify me. I need you to give me meaning. I need you to help me understand that I matter. And that is a crushing weight that I will put on her shoulders if that's the mentality I have. And listen to me and understand me when I say that she's unable to do those things on a consistent basis. And take this the way I'm saying it. She's not strong enough to do that for me because she was not designed to do and be that for me. Only God was, right? See, my wife can't be my savior. She can't be it. She can be superwoman a lot. And y'all know her. She can be superwoman a lot. But she wasn't designed to be that. But see, here's the idea. She can't be that. So what I'll do is this, and, and what you do is this. When I need her to be my identity, what I'll do is I'll smother her in an attempt, right? I need you to be, I need you to be, I need you to be. And she's going to be like, oh, man, you know what? My wife's independent. She ain't going to have that. But if I'm chasing around her and saying, I need you to validate me, what's going to happen to my marriage? It's going to disintegrate. We're just going to become partners. We're going to become really good roommates. And there's not going to be the marriage and joy that God did. Another way this happens a lot of time is through children. I mean, when you live vicariously through your children, we've all seen this, we've experienced it a little bit. It's the idea when their victories become our victories. When you do that, when their victories become your victories and you have to live your life vicariously through them, can I be <coughs> honest with you? You put a pressure on them to perform. Because what you're doing is you put pressure on them to mirror to you your value, your worth in a way that does not enable them to see clearly their own identity because you always need them to help out, help perform yours. That's a crushing thing, right? Man, I mean, let's just be honest. Parenting is complex, right? It's hopelessly complex. I mean, there's a lot of dads. And I remember when I was getting to be a dad, there were guys that, were, that would say this, you know, my dad would never come to any of my games. He just wasn't interested in me at all. I don't know how to relate to him at all, literally. He never came to one of my games. I played sports through high school. And I don't think he ever saw me play. And we work through that. We pray. We see forgiveness and all that. And then there's the other guy where my dad was at every, every practice, every game, coached me the whole way there, showed out my faults all the way back, talked about it at the dinner table. It was like eating vegetables. He just put pressure on me, always there and always like this. And, and I always had this thought, man, I better be good because I want to do this because I want him to love me. I've known kids be that way. i got to be good because I want him to love me and accept me. And so when I became a dad, I was like, wow, do I go to games? 
No, like, do I do I not go to games? Because I saw both sides, right? Like maybe I just go to half their games, right? Maybe if I could, be, maybe because I don't mess my kid up, right? Maybe I go to every other game and I'll be disinterested in one and all into it the next time. You know, you really think about it, it's really complex stuff, right? But here's what I think the answer to that is. I think the best that we can be with our kids is to be emotionally available. And for almost every man in this room that fights against everything that we know. To be emotionally available. And I think that's the best that we have is to be emotionally available. And that requires us to have an emotional IQ. But that's for a totally different sermon on another day. But I have this big in my notes. When you expect your kid to hold the mirror for you so that you can get your identity from them, this is making them ultimate in a way that's crushing to them. And they're never going to truly help you. When you're living vicariously through your kids, you're asking the kid to hold the mirror so, they, so you can see you. There is an old, old movie called Chariots of Fire. How many of you ever seen the movie or read the book Chariots of Fire? Okay. It's ancient. Okay, It's a story about Eric Lido. Eric Lido was a strong believer in Christ. Uh, in fact, after the Olympics, he went to China, served as a missionary until he died. And he was just this phenomenal runner. I mean, they just thought he, he's the best, right? No one's going to beat him. I mean, the gold medal race, though, was on the Sabbath. And this is back a lot of years ago. He refused to run on the Sabbath. He said, I'm not going to do it. And you can imagine, there's this immense amount of pressure on Eric. I mean, for your country, for your family, for your legacy. And he says, no, no, I belong to the king. I will not violate the Sabbath. And he has these great lines, like in the movie or in the book. And, and one of these great lines that he says is, he feels the pleasure of God when he runs. I love that sentence. But my experience is the exact opposite. <laughs> I mean, I feel the wrath of God when I run. I mean, you probably feel the same way. I feel the brokenness of sinful world when I run. Eric's like, when I run, I feel the pleasure of God. Okay? So all the focus is on Eric in the movie, but it's actually the other runner, Harold Abrahams, who kind of gives us some insight into making good things, ultimate things. So he's ready to go. He's kind of glad that Eric is not running because now he likes his chances now, right? He, and when he's asked about the race, here's what he says, okay? I have 10 lonely seconds to justify my whole existence. I have 10 lonely seconds to justify my whole existence. See what happens? His achieved identity is what? I'm an Olympic sprinter. Now think about this. His whole life has been about running and training. Everybody's going, you're fast, you're amazing, you're I'm the fastest guy I know. Then he shows up at the Olympics. And he's still one of the fastest guy, but Eric's a little bit faster, right? So who knows what's going to happen? I'm an Olympic sprinter. I'm a runner. It's who I am at the core. It's what defines me. It's who I am most fundamentally in my life as a sprinter. So if he loses the race, he's nothing, right? He has no identity anymore. He has no idea who he is anymore. And the reason that's not just crushing but excluding is if my identity is in whatever I'm going to be, right? If my identity is that I'm a pastor and I'm a preacher, then you know what? If my whole identity is I'm a preacher and that's what really matters. I get up here and preach. Then you know what I have to do? I have to try to out-preach everybody else that, that preaches, right? Because if you're a better preacher than I am, if you can deliver a sermon better than I am, if that's where my identity is, it just knocks me out of the world, right? I'm worthless. I'm not as good as so-and-so. And I've already accepted that fact, Okay. See, that sends me to a tailspin where I don't even know who I am anymore. You can't celebrate me. And honestly, it tries to destroy me. And I would do in that really subtle way, if I'm not careful, if I make secondary identity marks, the main thing, then you know what I'm going to be tempted to do. and know what you're going to be tempted to do. And you're not a preacher, great. Whether you're a salesman, whether you're a teacher, whether whatever you do at your job, you feel if your main drive is that's your main identity, and that drives you, you have to be better than other people when someone else is better than you. Hey, someone else is a better parent than you, you think? Then you've got to be careful because here's what we start to subtly do. We go back to the list. I'm going to need to slander you a little bit. I'm going to need to curse you a little bit. I'm going to need to maybe lie about you a little bit. If my identity is in my house or in my car or money, whatever it is you find, I see this all the time. Can I just tell you, people don't so much want to be rich as they just want to be richer than the people around them. That's what they want. 
They don't necessarily want to have the nicest things in life. They just want to have nicer things than the person around them, just to have a little bit more. Now, what is this? This is all identity stuff. So you say, Phil, what does this have to do with putting things to death, putting things away, putting off? Well, as Christians, we, we don't believe you achieve identity, but rather you receive it. Your identity, you receive in the creator, the God of the universe. That's where your identity comes from, right? You are who you are. So every morning, I don't know if you do this, you ever sometimes look in the mirror and say, I am a good person. I am going to be the best self in the day. I am a good mother. I mean, you can you can kind of give yourself a pep talk all you want, you know, but you know where you doubt. You know where you mess up. You know where you're morally corrupt. You know where you've been given into impulses and compulsions that are out of step with God. You know this. So you can give yourself a pep talk all you want. But if you're not careful, what happens when you can't fulfill the pep talk? You go back to the list, right? You become angry, which leads to what? Feminine. Which leads to what? Malice. Which leads to what? Wrath. And you kind of see we're back in the same cycle in places where Christians aren't supposed to be, right? See, I'll say this, and I'll close this so you know that you know I'm there. <laughs> I want you to understand the Bible says that we as children of God are esteemed by God. We are adored by Him. If you're like, well, Phil, I ain't ever read any verses that says that God adores me or I'm esteemed by God. I'm glad you asked. Romans chapter 8 says that we have been the adopted sons and daughters. Zephaniah 3 says this, that God sings over us and rejoices in us. Now stop for a second. If you're a child of God, do you truly believe that the creator of all the universe looks at you today who is hidden in Christ and that he actually sings over you and actually delights and rejoices over you. Do you really believe that? I'm telling you, most people can't get that. They, they, they're like, I, I just don't think that's true. In the book of Psalms, on repeat, the Bible says over and over again, you are delighted in, you are delighted in, you are delighted in. In Ephesians chapter 2, it says you're holy and blameless in his sight. In Colossians 1, he says you are spotless and blameless. He never lets us down. He does not fatigue on our failures. We are his sons, we are his daughters, and get this today, child of God. He delights in you, he rejoices in you, he sings over in you, and if you can get this, that is your identity. Not where you really mess up at being a parent. And that identity that God rejoices in you, that you are a child of God, is secure and it's unshakable. I'll end with this idea. So what? So if I were to be fired here from Emmanuel, you know, I'm a pastor, I'm a preacher, right? If the advisory committee had a meeting after service, say, hey, Phil, we can't believe you dogged out the Frozen movie. You know, we can't believe you did that. We're going to ask you to leave, right? And if I were to leave and I would no longer have that title of pastor and preacher, and, you know, if I lost that, but you know what would not have changed? I'm still an adopted son of the King of glory. Amen. And by the grace of God, he gets to preach and teach. That's really what it is, right? Now, if God forbid something were to happen to my wife, who is my best friend, I would be crushed. But I would still be a son of the Most High God. I still would be. I would still be adored. I would still be esteemed. I would still be loved. Who I am would not fundamentally change. Now, I'm going to need a lot of help if that happens. I'm going to need a lot of support. I'm going to need some time off. His. That's my identity, right? There was no money in my account or a lot of money in my account. So you have to understand all this frees me up to love you because I'm not so focused on me. It frees me up to love you, to support you, to cheer you on. This gives crystal clear identity about what my life is about. This forms an identity in me that you can't, I love you, you can't take away from me. You can't do anything to take that away from me. And you might send me a hateful text again because I blasted the movie today, you know, Frozen, whatever. And to be honest, I'll probably respond to you, goodness, I'm far worse than that. <laughs> you probably should pay attention more. I've got a lot more failures and faults. Here's why. I don't need to pretend that I'm more than I am. Amen. Neither do you. I don't need to pretend that I'm more than I am. I don't have to carry that weight. I mean, I do a few things really well. I think there's a lot of things I really think about, if I'm just being honest. And there's a fury to be found in that identity being in Christ. So 
how does that equate to putting things to death? As a child of God, I have access to the benefits and privileges it is to be a child of God that the world and that list of things can't offer me, right? So if the world in this list wants to offer me immorality, why do I want that when I can have what God gives the mingling of souls with my best friend? Where I can share this life with them and have closeness with them. See, that's a no-brainer. That's going to win over the other thing. You want to tempt me with being enslaved and burned up by anger when I can be free of that and trust God to just be God? And that God loves me and that even though broken people may come to me, guess what I can do to them? I can extend grace to them, right? It's this understanding of putting things to death because if I don't, you know what they're going to do? They're going to be devastating to me. And I really think this is huge in Christianity right now. We're so influenced by this view that we constantly have to step away from God and look inside of ourselves when God says, I called you by name. I know you. You are my child. And I'll just say this. I desperately, in studying this, really want us to get this. I really want you to get this. I really want you to get this. And I don't mean get this so you have kind of cute, shallow things to say over coffee. You know, I'm Christ is all. And I mean, that's not the mentality. But the mentality is this, that you are who you are because you are who you are right? for Christ is not in you. Not by your successes. Definitely not by your failures. And when we're tempted to look inward because of other circumstances and people, may we truly realize we are who we are because of who God has made us and that he loves you, he adores you, and he delights in you. May that be true that Christ is one. Let's stand together. People. Let's give you a moment, maybe with your heads bowed and eyes closed, just uh, nobody looking around just for a moment. And maybe that's something you're struggling with today. Maybe you're here today and you're just struggling with your identity. Maybe today is just a good day to get back and say, God, thank you for all the things that you've done in my life. Maybe it's time to pray, God, thank you for who you've made me to be. I am a son. I am a daughter of the Most High God. It's okay to be known as a parent or a pastor or whatever it is in life. But if you're in Christ, that is not your main identity. And if you constantly search for secondary things, it's going to be crushing. Remember, this is all part of the process of smoothing out the stone, right? Taking the jagged edges off. May God help us in that. Father, thank you so much for the day. Lord, I really needed this today. Lord, I am so tempted to be so dependent upon what other people think and other people say about me and what I do. And God, I thank you that you have offered freedom from that. But God, help me to take that offering. <coughs> help me to put off the things I need to put off to kill them dead. To not let those things come back. But God, to be the child of God that you desire me to be. But God, I know in my life that's going to be a lot of bumpy roads. It's going to be a lot of hard times and hard conversations. And it's going to be a lot of repentance. But God, I pray you help me in that way. Because you love me. You delight in me and you sing over me. Thank you for all you do. Christ's name. Amen. Amen. If you're interested in helping with BBS, if you would, just meet us down front here for a moment. But God bless you. Thank you for coming today. Amen.